because, of course, when we look at the, and think about the Human Rights Act, we have to remember its universal origins, and I'm going to keep coming back to that, because this is Miro, the artist Miro's uh, painting of, uh, of human rights that he was commissioned by the UN. So it's that sort of great symbol of, of what human rights are, and from that great uh, European internationalist tradition. Uh, um, but when we're starting looking at the, uh, the, the why we have the human rights side and where, we, where it came from, we do need to reflect upon the state of uh, the UK system of government before the Act came into force. So what did the UK look like back in the, um, in the, in, in the noughties, in the 80s and noughties, uh, and 90s rather, um, what did it look like? And we know that there was too much deference to decision makers We've been struggling to establish pr uh, principles of judicial review uh, for decades. Um, power really was um, unaccountable. Uh, and we know that the binary politics that the UK system of government is based around really did just facilitate that lack of accountability of power. Um, so famously, as Lord Chel Helsham referred to it, we in effect had an elected dictatorship whereby the executive really could do what it liked, particularly with the ridiculous majorities that you had, uh, both for the Conservatives and, and Labour in, in the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, and there were, of course, despite this assertion of freedoms, they were very limited. I'm equally curious that this should be a binary choice between the domestic human rights and international human rights. And if one reflects on the continental experience or across a number of uh, jurisdictions, uh, the two go together, so there are domestic constitutional charters of rights, on the one hand, uh, which um, you know, coexist uh, with uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, and there doesn't seem to be antagonism. I know, and it's interesting. The, the debate on, on the British uh, Bill of uh, Rights, as we know very well, uh, the Conservative uh, government has, uh, for years now, pursued uh, a, a policy that uh, um, expresses antipathy towards uh, core human rights. Uh, Convention, uh, European Convention on Human Rights in uh, uh, particular, uh, and uh, the, the timing of tonight's event uh, is of particular interest, uh, given that only in the last few days uh, we have had uh, a, you know, a new confirmation uh, from the Ministry of Justice uh, uh, that uh, they are continuing to pursue uh, a policy of uh, revisiting our uh, framework of core human rights, uh, uh, revisiting... So Liberty as an organisation has throughout its history advocated um, for privacy rights and specifically has long fought against invasive UK surveillance powers. In our advocacy, Article 8 has always been a very key instrument within our toolbox. A more historic example is our previous case from Strasbourg Liberty against the UK from 2008, which was of course a successful challenge um, on eight, Article 8 grounds um, to the interception of communications data under the Interception of Communications Act 1985. And that was set to me, which is what has Article 8 really done for Liberty, well, Big L Liberty. Um, first, what is really clear is that Article 8 has served as an effective tool for advancing privacy concerns and it has served us very well in our human rights challenges to date. It has formed the crux um, of our historic and current litigation challenging UK surveillance powers and has served as an effective tool in our strategic litigation as well as our policy work. Using Article 8 we have so far been able to successfully um, challenge both of the UK's previous surveillance regimes. Um, and have been able to show that they, they were in violation of our fundamental right to privacy. Um, however, that's not to say that it goes without any challenges, um, and I thought I would highlight a few of them, particularly in the context of sort of the interrelation between the UK system and, and the Strasbourg court itself. Um, I think in the digital age and how fast both the technology and the surveillance regimes themselves develop, the length of time that it can take to get a case before Strasbourg can mean that um, the judgments are behind on both, um, both the technology and the legislation itself before they are heard and judgment is given. Mm. Um, linked to that, again, on the complexity of the, the tech and the surveillance regimes themselves, um, what we find is that it can be somewhat difficult for the court to grasp really the, um, the nubs of these issues and it can make the court insufficiently flexible to rapid um, developments or to really take um, proper account of the risks flowing from them. As a final
through three areas in which the right to vote uh, has affected um, UK legal and political life. One um, a very clear uh, area of defiance is, is the area of prisoner voting. Uh, the area of timidity is where it's the timidity of the Strasbourg court and indeed following that of UK courts in respect of non-resident citizens, uh, often referred to as expatriates, so the right to vote of those who have left the United Kingdom more than 15 years ago and, and hence uh, disenfranchised in uh, electoral processes. And I want to highlight two areas in which I think uh, if we were to leave uh, the European Union, uh, Brexit uh, will potentially be litigated in uh, Strasbourg, even with the constraints under its timidity that I will highlight. One is uh, a potential disenfranchisement of currently eligible voters in local government elections, so EU uh, 27 citizens, and areas around the European parliamentary elections uh, on the assumption that they will not be held uh, in the United Kingdom uh, on the last week of May. Uh, so these are... Because the general view of judges in those days at the mention of children of offenders would usually be something like, well, she should have thought about that, shouldn't she, before she committed the offence, Miss Sikhan. So there was no real Im analysis um, on the impact of those left behind. Uh, and that's the point. It's, it's, it's those who are left behind, the very young and the vulnerable. It's their rights um, that the judges ought to have um, taken into consideration, but would never have in those days. So I, I, I mention that because we're here looking at what the Human Rights Act has done for us. And um, when it did come into force, um, it didn't have a sort of immediate or discernible if effect um, on the sentencing of primary carers at that time. Um, in 2002, there was a case called Mills in which the Lord Chief Justice um, set aside a, con uh, a sentence in relation to a, a, a mother, um, but he held in principle that mothers with no previous convictions who were caring for young children should not receive a custodial sentence for a non-violent offence where an alternative, alternative disposable, disposal was available. But he did not make that, make that decision on, uh, on, in reliance on Article 8, but um, it was against the background of a soaring prison population. And the number of women in prison in 2002 had gone up dramatically. At that time, there were about 4,000 women in prison. Uh, and on those particular facts, there was another obtaining money by deception. And she was a woman um, of impe impeccable good character, and the courts um, thought it was appropriate to just bang her up for, for eight months. Um, so the Lord Chief did take, at that time it was Lord Wolf, took, took the opportunity to make a decision that would affect um, um, all such mothers and not just the appellate. Um, but, but as I say, Article 8 hadn't really um, done anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, to, for, to, to, to help him reach that decision. And unbelievably, actually, if I think about it, um, as I have done, particularly before coming here, um, w w was that it wasn't until 2012, 2012, that in a case called uh, Pedrick, Crown Pedrick, um, that the Court of Appeal Criminal Division um, grappled squarely with the Article 8 ECHR considerations when uh, deciding what the correct approach was uh, to sentencing uh, a mother of dependent children. Almost one year after the Human Rights Act came into force, the Twin Towers fell. And the history of the Human Rights Act, I think, is indelibly connected to the legacy of that moment. Branded as the Villains' Charter, the Human Rights Act has been vilified ever since then for protecting terrorist suspects and other villains. The reputation it has received in this respect is only, in my opinion, partly true. So, of course, the influence of the European Convention on Human Rights on the protection of terrorist suspects predates the Human Rights Act. And those looking for sharp evidence of its influence in the sphere 
need look no further than Ireland and the UK in 1979, Chahal and the UK in 1996, which related to torture and torture risks in the extradition context, but also McCann and the UK in 1996 relating to the use of lethal force in the heat of a counter-terrorist operation. Now my own view is that the politics, that, that on many levels this counter-terrorism framework um, has played out. The politics of human rights has been deeply embedded in the vilification and othering of those that are seen as threats to security in this country and all over the world. So at, at the core of, of the challenge to the protection of human rights and the protection of human rights culture is, I think, an understanding that there's a distinction in people's minds between the deserving and the undeserving rights bearer. Human rights are. But when we think about human rights and the Human Rights Act, and kind of we look at that link between the convention rights themselves, bringing them into domestic law, but then actually how that works, those duties are, are tied in through the Human Rights Act. And for us, that, that first legal duty is actually where all of our work sits and where the everyday aspect of human rights sits. And for us, human rights kind of litigation is the end point for when things go really wrong. But actually, if you can use the Human Rights Act in a preventative way, in a way to secure better outcomes for people, with people, you can hopefully also avoid the need to go to court, which isn't to undermine court. Court is a really important process. Um, but there are lots of things that can be done before, um, before you get there. So the big part of our work is, is actually kind of looking at that legal duty and actioning that in kind of everyday life, both for people themselves, so that they can hold the people who hold power over them to account in their day-to-day -day negotiations. But Would it be the right to life, the right to the liberty, the right to free speech? People like the rights, um, but what they are less happy about is the way they're being implemented. Um, so, equally ours, so this is, um, this, the Thomas Paine Initiative started to fund some research which they've continu they continued doing up, up until quite recently over what people really thought. This is a YouGov survey that they did, which is really, it's not just a survey, it's a whole project. Um, really interesting, detailed um, research <coughs> on, on people, people, what people thought about human rights. And if you read it now in the context of Brexit, it's incredibly illuminating because it maps almost exactly as to what happened in the referendum. And if only we'd understood that at the time. I think what I think Jonathan said at the beginning, that when people were voting out of Europe, they probably, some of them probably thought they were voting out of the convention. I think there's a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of merit in that. So most people are neutral or ambivalent about human rights. And this is including the Human Rights Act, the convention, it's really sort of digging in. Um, and about a quarter each side um, are pro or anti. Uh, that's really important. So in 2014, you remember Chris Grayling um, put out a plan for a Bill of Rights. It's the most detailed plan we've ever seen of, of what the Tories want to do with human rights. It was quite detailed, and it was really about reducing rights protections and taking rights away from undesirable groups, um, stopping uh, the, the idea that you could not deport someone for Article 8 reasons, etc. And the Daily Mail did a YouGov, got YouGov to do some research, and they found that 43% supported the plan, if given a short summary of it. 43%, which split along party lines, as you would expect. So my tentative conclusion is people generally support human rights, but a good proportion think the current system is malfunctioning. We have to address that. Um, Politicisation and tribalism is a huge part of it, new labour, etc. Although what a Jeremy Corbyn government would do to that piece is very interesting because he and, and the people around him talk about human rights positively more than any, um, more than any politicians, mainstream politicians, that while I've been involved in, in, in this issue, which I think you might have, you might wonder what exactly they mean by it, but it's a it's still a really different thing. And you hear Labour supporters now talking about human rights completely differently than other, um, than, than other political groupings. It was after the Second World War that the recognition 
of the need to call things rights, whether they were or not, was dealt with by Eleanor Roosevelt. Unfortunately, it may be argued that the Declaration goes a bit too far. It almost suffers from overreach, so that it would be a very difficult document for any nation like our own, for example, to incorporate in a constitution in the way that America, Americans can look to a single document and incorporate. This document, short though it is, is, is too long for English people readily to turn to on a regular basis. And the last point about education is extremely important. But that document is too long for people easily to understand. This document is longer and even more difficult, the European one. But we realized at the end of the Second World War both that they had to come into being. And Churchill recognized, as he said, in May of 1948 in The Hague at the Conference on Europe, he said, we have to be prepared to surrender some of our sovereignty in order to avoid the terrible things that have happened. And in surrendering our sovereignty, we share something of the sovereignty of others. Those ordinary judges who deal with the majority of cases and therefore deal with human rights issues. And how, how was the Human Rights Act regarded when it came in? You asked the question. Well, I was out of the country more or less all the time then, but I came back and did a bit of sitting and stuff like that. And our English judges aren't that bad, you know. They're quite good. They're incorruptible. We never find them going to prison. But they're not the brightest things in the world. <laughs> they're not the sharpest <laughs> knives in the block in, in, in the kitchen drawer. And they have a sort of general, a general pattern of behaviour. So when the Human Rights Care Act came in, there was a lot of harumphing. Oh, the Human Rights Act. Oh, foreign law. Oh, this sort of stuff. Before you could say knife, they pretty well adjusted to it because they're workmen. They're there to do a job. And once they've got over being old-fashioned golf playing, whatever it is they do, um, <coughs> they will do the job for you. But, and this is why I was interested to hear the things you were all talking about, they will do the things for you, but if the law changes, they will change with it. And they won't themselves be, stand up. They aren't revolutionary. They're not radical. And the majority of lawyers are not radical. So what should we do about human rights in a dangerous environment? Maybe, and somebody was talking about the, over there, about the unwritten constitution. I know that there's a book coming out very soon which will argue that Brexit may be the moment at which the, the, the written constitution will become an unarguable necessity. It hasn't worked yet. But that is certainly one way, possibly, if it could be made simple enough for people to hold it up in the way the Americans hold up whatever it is, that wonderful amendment about the right to arms. Oh, second, second. Um, if they could hold it up and say, this is my right to life, this is my right to life, this is my right to family life, and so on, then just maybe, in what are very dangerous times, um, we will be able to substitute the blob of the acne cream for something that will have permanent effect. <laughs>